Welcome everyone to the hotel industry in New England. I'm Rick Kaplan from the New England Real Estate Journal. Let me introduce you to our panel for the hotel industry. Our moderator today is Rob McCarthy from Milan Hotel Group. And speaking on the panel will be Daley Tipton from Evolution Energy Partners, Harry Wheeler from Group One Partners, Karen Whitman from Broadacre Financial, and John Stalling from Northern Bank. Our corporate sponsors for today are U.S. Pavement Services, Group One Partners, Northmark, Northern Bank, and Evolution Energy Partners. Introduce our moderator. I think we're there. Our moderator is Rob McCarthy from Milan Hotel Group, and Rob will introduce our panel. Take it away, Rob. All right, Rick. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, we have an awesome, incredible panel today, and we're going to be going through uh, an overview of our, our industry. Basically, um, we have an agenda, and it will be about financing and the availability there, energy, design, and then what do you want to do uh, when it's time to sell? So our uh, panel today is Karen Whitman. Morning, Karen. Morning, Rob. Harry Wheeler from Group One. Hey, Rob. And Daley Tipton from Evolution Energy Partners. And John with the tuxedo from uh, Northern <laughs> 1031 Exchange or the bank. So uh, we're all going to learn a little more than we knew before we got on the line. So we're just going to jump right into it. And Karen, if it's okay with you, uh, we'll start with you. I mean, from your perspective, how has the hotel financing market changed as a result of the pandemic? So first, let me just introduce myself for those who don't know me, Rob. Uh, Please. Uh, I'm Karen Whitman, and um, I recently transitioned. I spent 30 plus years at Hilton doing development in New England and New York. So many of you know me from those years. In March of this year, I joined Broadacre Financial. Uh, Broadacre is a New York-based firm um, that was founded by former bankers. And uh, it's a real estate firm that is, uh, its focus is mortgage brokerage. Um, so that's a little bit of background. And just to, to get back to the question, um, so if we, if in order to look at hotel financing, let's take a look back at 2019. In 2019, the market was extremely frothy. For example, if a borrower approached uh, 10 banks, they, they probably received 10 different term sheets. Today, that same borrower would be lucky to receive two to three term sheets. As a result, there's been a significant increase in brokerage shop activity. Firms such as Broadacre Financial are being used by borrowers to help them source more opportunities. Um, in, in February 2020, just prior to the pandemic hitting America, um, it, if a hotel was achieving 100% or more rev par, they had a good flag, a good location, and good bar history, they did receive, uh, you know, 10 quotes. But by March uh, 15th, 2020, um, by March 15th, 2020, all of these quotes had disappeared. Um, none came back until at least Labor Day, if they came back at all. Um, opportunistic funds, rather than traditional banks, are now starting to look for opportunities. Demand far exceeds supply today. However, every month, um, more and more players are jumping back into the market. It's a very slow trickle, but the trend lines are moving in the right direction. However, options are very limited today with minimal flexibility compared to 2019. And what do you mean by that, Karen, minimal flexibility? Can you be a little, can you nail that down a little more? Yeah, I mean, uh, the terms are set. There's, there's not a lot of negotiating in terms of, uh, in terms of rates, in terms of debt service coverage. Uh, they're, they're very strict in what they're looking at. Fair enough, fair enough. Low and loan to value, all, all, all of those things, you know, with very low loan to values for today. And are you still finding uh, in underwriting it's still a 20% uh, equity requirement or is it higher up to 30, 35%? It, it is higher today. Awesome. 
Um, and what types of lenders, I mean, you touched on it briefly, but what type of lenders do you find are doing the deals today? Yeah, so traditional banks who were active uh, in the hotel space are uh, unfortunately today currently dealing with restructuring loans. Many are forced to give forbearance to their existing loans. Um, and due to the lack of revenue in, in so many properties today, borrowers have been forced to, to stop paying principal and many are just paying interest only. Um, this is causing the banks to carefully monitor their portfolios. Uh, as more and more loans go into defaults, banks are having to increase their cash reserves uh, and banks can't lend until loans become current or, or they get reserved. Uh, it's very similar to what's happening in the retail sector as well. Um, so this uptick in defaults and delinquencies are causing traditional banks to be more conservative and not lend to hotels. Uh, conservative institutions need the market to catch up so that they can take the reserves, sell the loans and clean up their balance sheets. Uh, they put the brakes on, uh, on uh, most new activity and that's, we, we anticipate that staying the same through the spring into the summer. The good news is that the vaccines have been successfully deployed and revenue streams are starting to trend in the right direction. Um, the banks that will consider lending um, are, are only considering lending to their existing clients. So very few banks are taking any new business. Um, debt funds are the most active in the hotel space. These are more opportunistic and will do non-recourse loans at a much higher rate. Uh, currently, uh, the debt funds are looking at 100 to 200 basis points uh, higher than banks and generally looking at terms of 12 to 36 months. Uh, most of these loans that are getting done are, are bridge loans. Uh, the debt funds want yield and the lend on good assets uh, who were achieving greater than 100% of RevPAR pre-pandemic. Um, uh, the debt funds are looking at the submarkets today and seeing how they've changed. And in many cases, one or two of the competitors have left the supply, which helps increase the market share for the subject loan. Um, the third source is insurance companies. And we've just seen a few hotel loans securitized uh, in the CMBS market and successfully so sold. Uh, these were loans that closed in January under very, very conservative terms. Uh, very low loan to value, 10 year terms with debt service coverage ratios that exceeded 2.0. Uh, this is very important to note because uh, bond owners are now considering buying debt, uh, which is a change, and they will consider buying hotel debt at very conservative levels. It is a sign that the market is starting to reopen. Uh, the ba this base case uh, of these loans sold uh, does set some parameters, and everyone is hopeful that other lenders will look at this and use this to set their own parameters and start lending again. Okay, and Karen, with all, with all that, if you're looking for financing, are you finding that the uh, underwriting standards have changed or is this something that our audience should be aware of in regard to underwriting in this new time? Yeah, so traditional loans um, are, are uh, taking a 10 to 20% haircut off of the 2019 uh, cash flows. So for example, um, it, uh, banks are looking at the trailing 12, and if a hotel had a million dollar net available for debt service in 2019, the trailing 12 today might show 800,000. Uh, so a bank will look at it and see it is trailing up, and they will do a bridge loan uh, with the, either a personal guarantee or with a debt service coverage reserve for one to two years. Uh, bridge loans are very customized, but they are short term. Most are three years with two one-year options. In terms of rate, uh, if you're looking at 10 million and higher, uh, rates tend to be in the high fours. If you're less than 10 million, the rates are higher, possibly into the low fives. Um, we see debt funds doing mezzanine and preferred equity. Uh, these are all being done with double digit rates and they are very selective in size. Um, in terms of activity, um, it, there's much more activity in the Southeast and Texas. Uh, and these are states that opened up uh, much quicker uh, than other parts of the US. 
Uh, there's definitely a lag in, in the Northeast and New England in particular. We think that lag is probably six months or so. Um, but the good news is that lenders are looking at pre-bookings and uh, wedding business is back and leisure business is back. So that is very, very helpful, uh, especially in New England. Um, in terms of new construction, uh, due to the long lead time, uh, there are a few select lenders who are starting to look at new construction. Uh, anything that starts today, uh, it won't open for probably 18 to 24 months. Uh, rates for new construction are in the high fours, uh, even to the low fives, but there are just a few lenders who are doing that. Um, it's important to, to just conclude that the market is extremely fluid right now and it's changing month by month. Uh, today, we're able to get three quotes for financing. We anticipate by September that will increase from four to possibly five. Um, and what we're seeing is, is now more than ever hotel owners as well as real estate owners in general, uh, they need assistance in navigating the waters. Um, as things are changing so rapidly. So firms such as Broadacre are seeing an, an, an influx in activity. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much for the expertise. So Harry, when we uh, get our hotel purchased, I mean, you want to take a second to introduce yourself and tell everybody about your worldly uh, organization there? Sure thing, Rob. Thanks. Um, Harry Wheeler, our principal at Group One Partners. Uh, we're based here in Boston and we work nationally uh, with our clients providing architectural interior design and procurement services uh, specifically for hospitality. And this is, uh, this is our 51st year in business. So we're, uh, yeah, it's been, been doing it for a while and always specialized in hospitality. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And from your vantage point, Harry, what changes have you seen in the hospitality industry as we come out of the COVID pandemic? And in your opinion, are these here to stay and are there more opportunities? <laughs> It's, um, it's interesting, uh, you know, obviously <laughs> there was a very quiet lull period for the first 12 months of this COVID uh, pandemic where uh, everybody was in a very much reactionary stage. And um, during that time, we worked closely and we monitored closely what the brands were doing um, and what independent operators were doing. Uh, at the time, and you know, even continuing today, it's very much an operational change. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of uh, major effects in the design of how the hotels are going. We've seen some, which I'll get into, but primarily we've seen much more in the operational and much more a hands-on approach with cleanliness of rooms, making sure guests feel safe, uh, big emphasis on the cleaning, um, you know, separation of some of the spaces within the hotels, uh, providing more opportunities for people to you know, gather in small groups or keep your families together in the dining areas and breakfast rooms. So things like that that we've seen, um, you know, people taking over their breakfast, their meeting spaces for, you know, additional areas for people to dine and, and, and eat. So I think we've seen people doing that for, you know, providing more space within the hotels. Um, from a design standpoint, we haven't really seen, you know, the breakfast rooms growing in size to accommodate, you know, twice the size for the same amount of people. I don't think the real estate is changing that much. Um, so what we're doing is trying to provide more, you uh, contact-free touch points, that's, you know, self-service check-ins. Um, you know, I traveled a bunch last week and I checked into every hotel I was at with my phone and it, some of them were independent. So it was very much more of a hands-on contactless experience getting in and out of the hotel. Um, there's apps now like uh, we've been using Toast a lot, which now you can actually, you know, order your food and pay for your food by your phone. So it's even, you know, limiting that contact with, you know, the checkout and the POS procedures. So, you know, it's a lot of design and time spent on how to manage that process while still keeping, um, you know, the feeling of hospitality, right? You don't want to feel like you're traveling in a no man's land. So, Harry, yeah. on, that, on, that, on that point specifically, are you seeing different uh, finishes required like LVT instead of carpeting or are you seeing more yep. cleanability and, you know, air purification systems, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. I think from a guest perspective, you know, harder materials just feel cleaner than softer materials. So, you know, going in hardwood floors, LVT, those just look and feel better than uh, than carpet does. It's definitely an added cost, which, you know, increasing cost right now, as Karen mentioned, it's tough to get. It's tough to get money. So increasing your budget by, you know, an extra few hundred thousand dollars is, is tough. But we're absolutely looking at a lot more of hard finishes, um, 
you know, even so much more as we were looking at things before, like paint versus wall vinyl for the breathability of the walls for, you know, less potential of mold and mildew. So, you know, painted walls, uh, hardwood flooring, um, you know, uh, tops that have, you know, you know, much easier to clean tops and quartz and stone, things like that. So, you know, much, much more of that and less things in the room, right? Less things to touch in the room. So, you know, more things that you connect to the TV or you connect to your phone and the days of having a whole book of paperwork at your, on your desk when you check in are, um, are, are, are gone. And with the LTV or the uh, hardwood floors, is there a solution for heating those yet? Or are they just all, you know, we're in New England. So yeah. that's one of the knocks is that, you know, the temperature of the guest isn't comfortable. Yeah. No, I, the, the funny thing, Rob, is, uh, you know, you spend all this money to put in hardwood floors in most properties, then put in area rugs under the bed. So that when you get off the, when you get off the bed, your, your feet touch something soft and warm. Uh, yeah. But yeah. The, the cost and the increase for heating these floors isn't, isn't there yet for, uh, we're not seeing floors being heated. Um, so if anything, it's still staying with the same kind of forest hot air type systems. Uh, if anything, what we're doing is we were able to put small electric heats um, uh, in the bathrooms. So mm -hmm. that is the, the bathrooms and the tiles and maybe the entryways are warmer. But yeah, the rooms themselves are kind of staying as is. And, uh, yeah, and with, the, with, well, all the hard, with, with all the hard surfaces, are you looking at the uh, STC or sound transmission coefficient? And is that costing more to do to limit the sound and provide a good guest experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, it's funny. It's not so much the noise. People think of the noise of just your, your, your heel clicking on the floor, but it's also the impact, which resonates a lot more than some of the volume of noise does. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, underlayments under these floors. So it's not just dropping the floor down on the concrete or the plywood. It's putting the proper, whether it's a cork or some type of, uh, you know, sheet product underlayment to absorb that impact noise. Okay, and that, okay. that noise translates from room to room. It goes under the wall, through the structure, and comes up next door. So, um, yeah, those – and it does – it costs more, but I think that's all into the cost of putting in these floors and, and upgrading these finishes. So it's kind of all comes together in the same price. Understood. Interesting. And what about the brands? You deal with pretty much every brand under the sun. What are you seeing from them? Is there a tightening up on the development timeline or standards yeah. or QA visits or, you know, what's yeah. the deal? Who's, who's next? What about Sinesta? <laughs> well, it's uh -huh. interesting. <laughs> you know, the, the brands themselves, you know, we're finding many of them aren't traveling yet <laughs> as much as you know, they're emphasizing travel. They're still, we're doing a lot of tours virtually, a lot of QA tours virtually. Um, so, but I think what we're seeing is brands, um, are still being bullish on development. So many brands were launched in 2018 and 19 that uh, those brands that didn't have a lot of traction are now doing really unique things to try to buy deals and, and grow those brands as people looking for opportunities, maybe looking for a little more something cost effective, maybe a better ramp up structure. And some of these newer brands are able to do that. So we're seeing, uh, especially, you know, um, Hyatt is one of the groups that we've been working with a lot that are you know, really being very aggressive in how they're putting deals out there because they launched a couple new brands in 2019. So, you know, they spent 2020 really aggressive trying to get their names out there. You know, Sinest is making a big change. Yeah, but, yeah. but right now, too, what we're seeing, we're, we still have a good amount of new development, but we're seeing a lot of PIPs repositionings and rebrandings through acquisitions. So I think okay. that's where we're going to see a lot of work for the next couple of years. Um, as the as the new build and 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 Karen can start giving people money out there and and uh, Daly can show them how to manage it efficiently and then John can show them how to sell it and not pay taxes until there all that lines up again the new development pipeline is going to be a little slow but we um we just brought on four new builds this quarter so that's uh that's good pretty, that's good pretty good when last year there were pretty much none <laughs> and at the end of the day though uh, Marriott and Hilton are still the eight hundred pound gorillas the, they will always be in. Marriott even more so is, is, is just the size of brands they have. Um, yeah. And it'd be curious to see if all their brands, you know, all their brands stay, you know, they're all Hyatt, Hilton, Marriott, they're all talking about potential, you know, do all the brands make it through this whole thing? Was it, was it oversaturated? I think they'll all stay. Maybe a few you'll see merge, but yep. um, I think for the most part, what we have now is what we'll have for a few years. Okay. Thank you. This next question is a setup for daily, but before we do that, what about the HVAC systems and the requirement for air filtration and the PTAC stink? I mean, is there is there a solution out there or is it still same old, just more powerful? You know, uh, the solutions, you know, it's PTAC, it's forced hot air, it's VRF, which is a very refrigerable system, which is looks like a PTAC, but works like a two pipe system. Um, so, and then there's the four pipe system, right? So we, we're still kind of stuck with the same systems. They're getting much better. They're getting much more efficient. 
But with that, and this could be a good segue, what we're dealing with now is just uh, a lot of a lot of the municipalities and cities and states, um, you know, pushing for low gas, low emissions, carbon neutral. Um, you know, some towns around Boston just went all electric. That any new development has to show that they can be all electric. Yeah. These are the things that we're dealing with. That the hotel industry, um, it's it, it's going back to P tax almost if it wants to be all electric. There's no really great all electric solution. So. Those are the things that we're struggling with all, you know, while paying for energy. So it's a great transition and I'm hoping yeah. more today. Yeah, too. daily, yeah. daily, you're up. How do we get this for free? So let, let me add something on the, on the PTAC and it, the, the fact that the occupancy sensor thermostat and the PTAC together, you know, the, the days of leaving and saying, I want it to cool in my room when I get back tonight. So I'm going to put the air conditioning at 62. And then, you know, I come back in and it's a, you know, ice cave zebra when I get back after being gone all day doing business. That should never happen again. Um, the <laughs> occupancy, occupancy control thermostat is the key for keeping that room and keeping it efficient so that the only problem is is with we got we have settings and need to make sure they're in a place where when someone's sleeping it doesn't turn off the uh, and they're very motionless it doesn't turn off the ac in the middle of the night and they get hot and then you get a complaint and so on and so forth but that's one of the energy conservation measures that that should be considered with the ptac unit and, and the other things that we see because a lot of times we'll we'll ask how the uh how the the rooms are controlled and the, the, you know, you go behind the counter and there's a com nice computer system that nobody really knows how to use and it will control all the rooms. But the staff is like, yeah, we used it for a while, but the guy who knew how to use it, he left and then mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And so um, that's one of the biggest, biggest challenges, but I'll, it, Rob, go on with, you, with your first question. I think you're going to ask me about the pandemic and, and what we're, what we're seeing, I think. But well, before you do that, Daly, give the 30 second overview because I'm, um, you know, so people know who you are. Partners, we are a consultancy. Um, we're, we're literally our, our owners and our owner of our company has been been with this company for 30 years. It started as a family biz business, was sold, bought by a Fortune 500 and then bought back from the Fortune 500 as a private entity. Um, we service about 600 uh, logoed customers, 6,000 sites nationwide, as well as Canada. And we do some stuff. We, we support uh, customers in Europe as well. Um, we do three things and we do it really well. We do your energy risk management um, where we manage, we help you manage what you have to purchase because everybody has to buy energy. And we know that there's, you know, the energy line in the PL, the utilities is, you know, at the top. And it's one of the top three, whether it's employees, taxes, and then utilities. And we focus on the utilities to drive cost out of that. Um, we do that. The next thing we do is we do energy efficiency projects, which we were talking about. One of the energy conservation measures, your ECMs is what we, we call those, um, which we just talked about a little bit ago. And then um, we provide data management tools. And the key for the data management tool is, is that I get my bill what's the date well i've had it for a while now but if i get my bill on this on the fifth or sixth right the seventh of the month maybe the tenth i don't know and i look at it and i go holy crap we spent a lot of money last month on energy by the time i get anything going that i'm thinking about to change the way i'm operating it's already the 15th and i'm already halfway through the month and i can't do anything about it so that's over the shoulder management by using a data management solution, weather normalization, and these things are very inexpensive and looking forward and not only looking at the individual entity, but looking at your portfolio of hotels that are in the, you know, that, that are owned, you're able to start managing yourself forward. You're able to start budgeting for your energy. You're able to start doing the things and making those smart decisions. So risk management of purchased energy, energy efficiency of operations, driving cost out, out of the operations, and then managing so that you can measure and manage what you're doing and start to make business decisions to really drive out, drive out costs. Yeah. All of those things, everything we do increases the sustainable footprint of an organization, of the they portfolio know. and of, of the facility. And Daly, staying on that, you know, purchasing energy, it's getting more and more common, but people are still concerned because it's so complex to the novice. You know, do you go 12 months? Do you go 66 months? Yep. Yeah, are all the third parties the same? How do they get paid? Because you're not paying them. If you could just yep. give a little education on that. All right, so let's, I, I talked to the uh, hotel industry group, a statewide group a few weeks ago, and I had ever said, you guys tell me, you want me to explain your energy bill? And they said, yeah, make it simple. And so I'll, I'll do that real quick. There's three things on your energy bill. Your, there's your energy that's purchased, which is the market rate. That's the one thing. It's, it's measured, it's 
sold, it's like a stock. And it, it whether if you're on a fixed rate, you pay the same thing each month because you're on that one year, two year, three year deal. That is one element in there. Then there's your capacity. Your capacity charges are based on your highest usage during the previous year. And those things can go. And now you can manage your capacity by your function. And that's one of the things we help try to help you with is, is if you want to try to drive down your capacity charge chart, you, you can do things throughout the year in order to do that. And then the third thing is your transmission. Whatever the utility is charging you to push electricity through the wire to get to you, that's a charge. It all it's and it's all a function. But there's three things on your bill. The only two things on your bill that you can really manipulate is one, the market rate when you buy it and how you manage it. And two, how much you're paying somebody to manage it for you. A, an organization like ourselves, we like to think of ourselves as the E-Trade of, of energy, where we charge a very low um, <clears throat> quote unquote commission rate to manage your energy for you because we want to do a whole bunch of other stuff, which you know we make money when you save money. So it's- And when you say very low, is that one mil, four mils? What is that? It's less than, generally less than three mils, depending on, on the size of the organization. The bigger okay. the organization, we go down very low, but you know- okay. And you see, you know, we see, we see up to, you know, places that we're talking to, they're paying up to 10 mils. Understood. One guy for, you know, all these years and that's their buddy, right? And mm -hmm. he's making a fortune, has a beach house. And uh, we say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And what about the length of the contract? Um, let's, let's talk about the market. Let's, let's, let's talk about where the market is right now. So 15 year trend from, left to right, 15 year trend is there, it's coming down. And there's a lot of factors that are causing that to happen. Um, the, factor, the factors are many different things, the cost of energy, natural gas production in the United States, there's all kinds of stuff that go into that, but just know that energy is trending down to the left. In short term, energy is trending up in the near future. Warm winter of 2019-20, Headed into the pandemic, everybody shut down their buildings, supply, demand. We had the lowest, we had 20 year lows in July of 2020, where if you were able to contract at that time and do a long-term contract, you got really good rates and you did really well. The, what's happening right now, as we come out of the pandemic, we're starting to see demand increase. We're starting to see there were some uh, natural gas uh, disruptions due to storms and everything and the, that we had. Uh, there was the, the lunacy that happened down in Texas in, in February. There's all kinds of, all kinds of stuff that's, that's happened. But what you're seeing is in the short-term trend, it's up. But if you step back from that up and you look, look out to the 12 month, we're going to start to see that trend go back down in a 12 month period. So what we're talking to customers about is their risk tolerance, their ability to interact and our ability to support them in their decision making process on the, on what whether they want to go all in in a fixed rate or whether they want to have half in a hedge and what what they want to allow to float and look at how we can start to capture over this hump. We manage the risk over the hump, and then we get to the backside and we start looking at the future, uh, future again for, for long-term. Still today, if you know, long-term contracts up to three years are still your, your best risk averse. Um, awesome. No, it, the energy is still, you know, when we're talking movement, it's not like drastic. It's, it's right. a gradual increase. Monday, Monday was a big, big blip in the market. There was a 5% increase in, in electric costs in the United States on Monday for the open markets. Um, you know, that, that takes into consideration and, you know, that, that, that's the first real big jump we've seen in a while. But, but anyways, it's, it's, uh, it's all dependent on how you want to manage yourself going forward and what, how we can help you get through what we see as a, as a, a future hump and then start to drive, drive down in the future to capture those savings as we go forward. Awesome. That, that's kind of... I do want to say something about green energy. Um, Jack's on the call. Jack and I have been working with a bunch of clients in, in New England. Green energy... Green energy and brown energy are fairly close in Massachusetts. We've, we've seen 1.25% difference. So if you have a desire to put your, your hotel on 
on a green energy um, purchase agreement, there's great opportunity out there to find savings. We've actually seen, seen savings in green energy that's less than brown energy wow. when you're buying it off the grid. And that's due to the construction price of green, of industrial green, uh, green energy, which is you know wind and solar that are now, those costs have decreased actually to at the same or lower than brown energy construction for expansion. And so you're able to buy the, that commodity, start to see that commodity come down at a lower rate, which is really, you know, it's real, very heartening for the, uh, for the future of the, you know, the quote unquote green economy. There, there you go. That being said, it's almost a no brainer for people to be doing that regardless of the asset that you own. Yeah. What other low hanging fruit do you see out there in regard to retrofits or rebates on new equipment or those kind of things? Now, rebates, rebates in New England are great. Um, there's there's all kinds of uh, great opportunity out there um, that, that can be captured. Um, first, the audit process needs to happen. It needs to don't ever pay for an audit. Have somebody come in and audit your facility because they're not. If somebody's if you're paying somebody for an audit, you're you're going to be paying more for the for the future. Have them come in and audit your facility. Tell you create a plan for you, create an, an, an energy conservation measures plan, and then you pick up those plans based on the ROI. Um, low hanging fruit, of course, lighting, oxygen sleep based thermostats, variable speed drives, look at your cook hoods, cook hoods suck out, you know, conditioned air, they shouldn't be on 24 hours a day. Um, and an on light, on lighting daily, are you saying it's just natural to go to LED or is it more LED, straight, LED straight across, even if you've, um, even if you've retrofitted in the past 10 years to, to the, uh, the, the, the low, the, um, the, the early, early models, we're even seeing upgrades and where there was payback. LED pays, the payback we're seeing is somewhere between one and three years all the time, even without rebates. You have okay. rebates and on top of that, you can drive that down. Um, there are so great solar opportunities in New England. Um, if you have roof, roof space, upgrading your, um, your building automation system and, and making sure that the systems that you have on the wall are used. If you have occupancy-based thermostats that you can use that are high, hire someone to train your people in order to do that. Um, I've been with uh, our chief engineer where he walks through a facility and he looks at it and he goes, hold on, I'm, during the audit, he just goes over and reprograms the thermostat on the wall that takes care of the whole lobby and you know, saves, saves the client $1,000 a year just by re that reprogramming. You know, it, it didn't make us any money, but it sure helped, it helped our client, right? Uh, simple things, there's, a, uh, there's a, an invisible pool shield that goes over your heated pool. You just pour the oil in once a week. You, the swimmers never know it's there and it's wow. a field. It mixes up with the water when swimming happens and then it floats back to the, back to the surface. You don't even know it's there. Um, water conservation, flow meters, untamperable. We put them in and they pay for themselves. You, we put them into the actual pipe so that the, the, the user can't, we really do that on college campuses. It's great because the kids can't take the shower head apart. Um, but you know, those are, those are some of the, the long-term stuff. And I did don't, I, there's, there's opportunities just real quick. And, and Karen made me think about it with financing. We offer financing opportunities for as simple as like buying a car, leasing the, the equipment that we, that you buy $1 buyout at the end of five years. It's a, you know, simple, simple term to on-bill financing. Um, we have three suppliers that we're qualified with that will actually put it on your energy bill. So let's say your energy bill is $10,000 a month. The energy conservation measure we put drops it to $6,000 a month as a projection from the, from the calculations of how much you'll be paying in the future. Then we finance that for a five-year period at $3,000 a month for, for that project. And then you're, so you're paying less, you're paying your, your net net, you're paying less, and then it's paid for on your energy bill. Never comes out of your capital stack. It, it wow. doesn't, doesn't impact your, your loan, your loan basis. And then there's CPACE financing, which is a, uh, a, a program that has to be voted in by the township, but it actually puts the bill on your property bill and when are your property tax bill. And when you're looking at chillers, boilers, large, long payback, 
and you don't want to bring that money out of out of your your capital expenditures, you can finance that through CPACE. And there's a lot of CPACE lenders out there that are capable of doing that. And it it actually it it goes with the sale, so that the CPACE it, all it does is increase your property tax bill. It stays there for the duration. It can be financed over a 20 year period. We're also doing that with some solar, where folks want to buy their solar array rather than renting the roof. That well. they can and buy the, they can go ahead and buy the solar array, put it on a CPACE financing, and it's it's paid for on, on the... Uh, so there's some very creative ways out there to get these projects done. It, it requires us working with the CFO, requires us working with the owners, you know, the the, the folks that are, that are you know, all, a lot of, lot of fingers in the, in the pie when you start doing those things. But that's really what we do. We help, help you navigate that. So low cost, um, low cost, upgrade facilities, save money. Sounds like a lot of people should be calling you. I was, I was, we're uh, we're pretty busy. I'm uh, there there's a lot there of stuff, a lot of stuff going on out there, but we're happy to you know, ha happy to take on some more some more customers and uh, and and find some find some folks. Good for you, man. Good for you. The facility. Yeah. Hey, and uh, la last question uh, on your end. You know, give us something that we can do right when we get out of the chair. What action steps can we take at our hotel to uh, you, drive down energy uh, consumption? If, if right, right out of the chair. If you've got, if you you've got um, occupancy based thermostats that aren't being used, go find somebody to fix those things for okay. you. And if you're not, if you're on a um, variable rate um, with your first, know what the mill rate is you're paying, you're paying for your broker. It, he's your buddy. You go out and have beers with him. Find out the mill rate, and um, if you're if you're paying if you're paying more than what we talked about, give me a call, and we'll find find something better for you. Um, and and in addition to that, try to figure out a plan for your organization to start clicking off these energy conservation measures, and because they pay for themselves. And when we when we decrease opex, increase NOI. We increase the value of the property. There you go. There you it go. Makes sense, right? So just, yeah, awesome. <laughs> so John Starling, we've we've learned how to get a hotel. We've learned how to decorate one. We've learned how to make it energy efficient. We want to sell it, man. How do we pay as much taxes as we possibly can? Well, we've come a long way, Rob, and I love the way you organize this um, this uh, presentation with, you know, starting with finding the money to buy it and develop it and and then improve it and energy efficient and and all the things that need to be done all the way and and I'm just uh my mind is spinning with the complexities of moving from the beginning to me at the end so and this doesn't have to be at the end but this can be uh 1031 exchange of course is the process that the IRS allows for investors in real estate to not have to pay tax if they are reinvesting their proceeds back into new real estate or existing real estate. So just as an introduction to, um, um, and a little background, I've been involved with uh, helping people um, avoid paying tax on the sale of their real property um, for about 20 years and uh, coming from a legal background and then working now for Northern Bank and Trust. Um, I just, I, I don't, I don't do lending and I don't know anything about lending like Karen, but I have um, a division that I run for Northern to give them uh, a full service capacity so that their banking customers can and and also any customers from anywhere in the country can um, take advantage of our services and feel secure in knowing that our 1031 company is wholly owned by Northern Bank and Trust so that their funds while they're being held by the fiduciary are fully protected. So that just gives you a little background on on Northern 1031 and Northern Bank. When we talk about selling, um, it could be for the purpose of retiring. It could also be for the purpose of acquiring um, better locations. It could be for the purpose of diversifying, uh, buying, you know, selling one or two and buying three and four. It could be so we could leverage up 
it could be so we could consolidate, sell two or three small properties to buy a larger, um, maybe a, you know, a, a cornerstone project in the middle of some, some big metro area. Um, but lots of reasons, uh, retirement, um, um, estate planning, lots of reasons why people want to uh, sell their property, but not really get out of real estate, not really get out of long-term uh, investment. So under the 1031 code, uh, a hotel owner could, can sell his hotel and his business. If he sells his, his business, he's going to have to pay the tax on the gain of the business itself. But on the real estate portion, he can avoid the tax. And remember, the tax can be substantial if he purchased the property some years ago. And over the course of those years, it's, it, the, the property has appreciated in value. And he has decreased his basis through depreciation of the property over the course of the years to give him a tax break during the years of ownership. Then when he looks at selling, he's looking at a huge profit because not only does he have to pay tax on the appreciation, but he also has to pay depreciation recapture tax on the depreciation that he's taken over the years of ownership. So that could be fairly substantial. Now, the current capital gains rate is 15% for those of us that are in the any of the lower tax bracket and 20% if you're in the highest tax bracket. Then you've got the net investment income tax, sometimes lovingly called the Obamacare tax because it was, in, it was introduced during his administration, Ron. And um, then you've got the state tax, which can be fairly severe. You know, Massachusetts, 5.1, 5 several of the other um, New England states are, have, have a higher tax. And if you're in California, uh, you, you know that they're trying to increase it now from 13 and a half up to 16.8%. That's the state tax on top of the federal tax. So, um, and then recapture depreciation is at 25%. So you're looking at anywhere from 30 to 45% in tax of your profit. Now, how can we avoid that? Well, if we're acquiring replacement property and we buy of equal or greater value and we use all the cash that came from the sale of the relinquished property, then that would affect a 1031 exchange and there would be no tax on the sale of the relinquished property. So that's the basics of the 1031 process. No, no tax forever, John, or for a 10 year period? Well, there would be no tax forever as long as you keep real, as long as you stay in real estate forever. Okay. Now, the way, the, 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 that's a great question because the way it's structured now with the tax laws is, yeah. is that real estate gets preferential treatment. It's, it's kind of like a sacred cow, you know, right. uh, the, the, the founding fathers felt like that if you had an ownership interest, you would take more interest in your country. And so they, they gave us tax breaks on ownership. So what's, what's happening now is even when you, when you die, your heirs get a stepped up basis in the property that you leave to them. And so then the tax would never be paid. Okay. And so okay. you can't avoid paying the tax forever as long as cradle to grave, I like to call it. In other words, if you stay in real estate, now you don't have to stay in the same properties and you don't have to stay in properties that you have to manage. You know, you right. can buy properties that are being managed by others through Delaware Statutory Trust, right. or you can buy long-term leased, um, triple net leased, um, Fortune 500, you know, company leased properties. Right. And, you know, there's just a lot of things you can do if you're buying in more hotels or different hotels in better locations for your particular purposes, then you're just trading one asset for one or two more. Right. So, and John, I don't, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole too far, but on that specific subject, isn't it a like property? I mean, a hotel seller doesn't necessarily have to invest his 1031 in another hotel, right? He could do an apartment or an office building. Yes. Like kind just means it has to be real estate for real estate. Okay. Now, for okay. use purposes, there are 
there are uh, um, restrictions against use. So in other mm -hmm. words, if the use is for long-term capital gain or investment or business purposes, yeah. it's like kind. If your use is going, if you're going to, you know, sell that hotel and go buy a, a $5 million oceanfront home in Miami or $10 million home or 25 now, um, you are going to not be able to live in that home for at least two years. You're going to have to rent it out so that okay. you can meet the criteria for 1031 being like kind. Like okay. that it has to Fair be enough. Property. And, and what about if I thought I was brilliant at the beginning of my purchase and I did a cost segregation method? Is that going to affect the 1031 exchange and process or is that irrelevant? No, it's not irrelevant and it does affect it, but it's, it's not a negative impact. Um, so cost seg, let's make sure everybody understands. Thank you. Um, if you are going to do a cost, seg, if you want to try to depreciate more uh, at, at the beginning over the first few years of ownership, you can have a cost seg study done so that part of your real estate can be depreciated over a very short period of time. The IRS requires you to depreciate residential property over 27 and a half years and commercial property over 39 years. So cost sex studies allow um, hotelers to depreciate a portion of those of that property over a much quicker time frame, maybe over five years, maybe over 10 or 15 years. And you're talking about items like the wiring, uh, the fire alarm system, some of the HVAC, the security system. So cost seg studies give breakouts for those portions of the real estate so they can be depreciated faster. Well, that's all well and good, and that works great for cash flow during the initial years. The problem comes when you start to sell, because when you sell, now you've got to recapture depreciation at 25%, and that recapture is going to cost you a lot of money in tax. Now, if we, if we sell a property that's been cost segregated, then that, then some of that property is now considered 1245 property rather than 1250 property. That's just tax code property for shorter term depreciated property versus longer term depreciated property. So it, 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 you don't know. I mean, there's not a recommendation whether well, cost seg is a good thing or you pay at the end or it doesn't matter. Well, it, it, I think it's a great thing to get to increase your cash flow initially. Um, and at the end, you just have to be mindful that you've got some 1245 property that you're going to have to replace when you buy your replacement property. So that way it won't hurt you. In other words, if you're going to buy another hotel, you need to have a cost seg study done on that hotel so that you can you can utilize those shorter term depreciated, the shorter term assets against the shorter term assets that you're having to carry over from the old property. Okay. Well, so in fascinating. Fact, you can, fascinating. In, in and, fact, you can, it won't necessarily hurt you if you're buying replacement property that has the opportunity to have a cost sex study done on it as well. Awesome. Thank you for that. And then, you know, there's a new administration and people on the phone might be considering selling their hotel. What's going to happen if they wait a long time and the new tax reform passes Congress? I mean, I know there's no answer, but you have more knowledge about that than the rest of us do. Would you share that, please? This is where I like to get out the big crystal ball, right? And we put it on the table and we go into the seance session. I, I, I don't know, but I do know this. If tax reform passes in its current form, it's going to cost you a ton of money in tax when you get ready to liquidate your asset. Um, they're trying to do away with 1031 for any property that you sell that has to have, that has a profit of more than 500,000. So small investors can still take advantage of 1031. Investors that have accumulated over the course of years, maybe their lifetime, more than $500,000 worth of profit are literally being put at a great disadvantage. I was, I was just going to say another word. It starts with an S, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the idea here is that um, if you have more than $500,000 worth of profit in your property that you're selling, you, 
under the current proposal, the Biden proposal, which is not past Congress, um, you would have to pay tax. You would not have 1031 opportunity to reinvest and continue to grow and stimulate the economy and right. continue to preserve your own profits. In addition to that, they're putting the second, you know, the one, two punch we've got, really what we've got is a one, two, three punch now. So the two punch is doing away with capital gains tax. So in essence, instead of paying 15 or 20%, you're gonna pay 40, 45%, you know, to, depending on what your ordinary income tax bracket is. So capital gains would go out the window under the new proposals. And third, the third punch is, which adds insult to injury for me, because, you know, this affects everybody in the economy, not just the wealthy, which, you know, they were touting as being, uh, um, having to pay a, a, a bigger share of taxes and the, and the one, and the, the citizens of our country that are not so wealthy, not being affected. This affects everyone. The third punch is they're, they're, they're talking about doing away with a stepped up basis. So when you pass your assets along to your, you know, your legacy along to your heirs, they will then uh, have to have the burden of tax at, you know, at that point in time as well. So that one, two, three punch is a killer. I believe that the economy um, will um, be severely affected if you take the real estate market is, is, a, is a bright spot in our economy right now. It's really booming. And I think you'll, you'll, you'll quail or slow the real estate market by enacting these three items. And I think it's going to be bad for the economy in general. So that's my pitch. That's great. And John, just sticking on the 1031, I mean, regardless of party affiliation, this is a powerful vehicle that everybody seems to enjoy. Do you feel the likelihood that that aspect of this program is going to get changed? I mean, won't that get tossed out at some point? You know, I, I'm hopeful. We've got about 89 associations nationwide, National Home Builders, National Realtors Association, the Home, the Farmers Association, American Farmers Association. 89 associations are, are all, you know, in favor of keeping 1031 and, um, and they're obviously going to be involved in, in great lobby efforts to, to educate congressmen, especially junior, junior congressmen, um, about, you know, the long-term effects on the economy of getting a short-term boost in taxes. Okay. And John, you know, we, we think of banks and we think of going to borrow money from the banks. We don't necessarily think of going to banks when we're selling. I mean, how, how do you get your customers? Why would people go to you? It's a, it seems like an unusual niche. Yeah. Um, you mean my, our association with the bank? Yeah, your 1031 business. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, the, the issue, I think, that would be um, of great comfort to most um, 1030 investors that want to utilize 1031 is that by when you, in the process of, of, of uh, in, in enacting a 1031, you have to, the funds that you receive from the sale of your relinquished property have to go into the qualified intermediaries account, into our trust account to be held until the time that you um, purchase your replacement property. And by being a bank owned qualified intermediary, we have all the protections that would be afforded under the Federal Banking Commission Acts and regulations so that, that our exchanger's money is fully and completely protected. Okay, and that's, thank you. That, that's why the bank, having the bank as the owner of the exchange company is, is a, you know, a benefit to the exchanger. A, di a distinct advantage for sure. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you all panel. Rick, um, you want to chime in here? Yeah, you sure you don't have anything else to say, John? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was great, John. It was great. 
No, I, I, you know, it was great because every, like I always say that 1031 is always a hot topic. Everyone wants to know what's going on with that, but we have a couple of questions we'll get to. Uh, you know, one of the questions that came in is how are the employees returning to work? Are, are, are hotel work is coming back. Is that been an issue? So I can, I, I can jump in a little bit. I just came back from the uh, Hunter Hotel Conference down in Atlanta. And uh, there was a panel just dedicated to the labor issues that are going on right now in the hospitality industry. And the majority of these large owners were talking about the fact that occupancy and demand and rate is all picking back up again in their markets, but they can't open the hotel more than 30 to 40% because they don't have enough staff to clean the rooms and satisfy and, and, and service the guests. Restaurants were still closed. Um, the, the, the hotel we were at was a convention center hotel and they had to incentivize or bonus 300 employees just to come back to work for three days um, to service the conference. And then they, they were done after those three days. So that was the biggest part of this recent conference was all about the labor industry and how to get people back to work and what, in, what companies are doing to get them there. There weren't really any answers yet because this is this is a very new <laughs> new topic. So yeah, and Harry, to that point, two two, you mentioned uh, contactless check-ins. Are you seeing more kiosks put into hotels? Are those an accepted vehicle or not at this point? No, absolutely. Kiosks are going in, but the funny thing is, Rob, is there still needs to be somebody there to help the person that can't use the kiosk. So yep. It, yep. it might be contactless, but it's not serviceless. <laughs> okay, excellent point. Excellent yeah. point. So Rick, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's it's, that's definitely a big topic that uh, that took center stage at this recent uh, co uh, hotel conference that there were a thousand people in person for all talking about this same issue. Yeah, no, that definitely answers yeah, the question. To that, I'm working with three of the largest hotels in Philadelphia on the on the to the city of Philadelphia building tune-up right now because there's a energy efficiency mandated by the city as well as there's same same type of things in Boston and other cities, but. Every one of those that I go in just recently, it, they're concerned about the uptake and what's going to happen with when people not returning. I mean, when you're talking about one hotel with 350 staff at normal normal loading, it, and they're down to you know <laughs> less than 50 right now, it's uh, it, there's a real there's a real change that's going to have to happen in the near future. No question, no question. You know, I, I have a question regarding that is, you know, in, in, and Rob, you said with kiosks, you know, if a hotel is thinking of doing a little more with the uh, electronics and digital aspects of handling some of the service aspects of what they do, as far as like the, the key systems for the rooms, uh, you know, just uh, customer service on a, a separate location, you know, different things like that. Is that something that... Uh, yeah, it had been in the works before pandemic too. I mean, most companies were moving towards, uh, you know, you would be able to control the lights and the TVs yep. and everything from your phone. You'd be able to check in, check out. Um, and that, that was all in the works pre-pandemic. Pandemic has, has obviously pushed it forward. And I think most of the major hotel companies have programs underway. I'll tell you one of the other biggest things that we heard, and this was part of, this was a follow-up panel to the panel about the labor shortage, was about how hotels are gonna be servicing their guests moving forward and what operational changes there might be. Um, one, of the, one of the big uh, ideas that was thrown out there that was, is gaining traction is following the airlines. You pay for your bag, you pay for your, you pay for your, about it. You, you pay for your room selection. You want your, you want your room changed every day, 10 more dollars. You want this, 10 more dollars. And you know, it's right now because that's the only way they can manage getting people is pay the people to service the rooms you pay for the service. Right. So it's, um, you know, it's, it, it, this whole thing has turned up a very a lot of uh, unique discussions right now in the hotel industry. This, so I think the service is going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of changes coming to the service aspect of our industry in the next year. And the lack of housekeeping, you know, people yeah. don't want don't want you in your room while they're there. So that does help the labor situation yeah. as well. A little bit, for sure, for sure. So then robotics might be coming into play and things like that, which uh, daily, all these electronic things that, that this is going to help uh, with the your business as well, I'm sure. 
Well, I, I think on, on the energy usage side, you're going to see more and more, you know, Internet of Things type um, type type operations where everything's handled through the central location or app related. And, and yes, that's going to going to electrification is is definitely the key. But I think you're going to see, you know, the more the more efficient efficiency is going to increase. It has to increase. And as as we start start doing things, and so um, I, I I think that there will be in, in general there will be a, a decrease in energy use per square foot over time just due to efficient products being put into the into the hotels. Fair enough, Rick. We're and, coming up on time. Is there any other questions? Yeah, I I, I want to get to one more question that uh, I think. This could be a good question for everyone here, and that's the uh, 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 rethinking the current space in a lot of hotels, the design change that, uh, you know, because of this COVID-19, you know, and some of the uh, safety and uh, precautions that people, uh, all uh, public space has to take. Uh, do you see so that uh, design change coming? Or is it already in place? I'll start. I think it's already in place. And I'm not sure it's so much of a design change as it's more really just a operational change of how people, I, I don't see hand washing sinks being stationed in lobbies or anything, but, you know, sanit sanitation stations or sanitizing areas, absolutely. And, you know, going in and, and seeing somebody wipe down the desk before you check in, you know, these, these are just good practices that, uh, I won't say we were lax on for a while, but you know, cleanliness isn't a bad thing. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so I, I think some of these are here to stay, and they're probably just good housekeeping measures. You know, some of the extreme ones, we'll see if those stick around or not. You know, smog fogging rooms and things like that. I think that might go by the wayside pretty soon. But a lot of the stuff is again, it's just kind of good, pra good practice. Excellent. And I think before we go, I just. This is going to have to be very quick, but if everyone could just give me like a, you know, uh, just a little highlight of what they think is coming uh, in the next year. So, so I think things, you know, people are going to start traveling again. I think um, the leisure business and the individual clearly will do that. I think groups will lag behind. I think international travel will lag behind. And I think commercial travel will lag behind. I think it will all start up, but I think it's going to be, you know, a slower road up. Um, I think the summer in New England is going to be fantastic. Everybody wants to be uh, resume normalcy. You see it in the restaurants already. Uh, it's hard to get reservations uh, hotel activity is clearly following suit. So I think we're on, on, on a rise. I just think it's, it's going to be a slower slope than uh, we all predict. Yeah. Great. I Thanks, agree. Karen. I agree with Karen. I think the leisure, you can't, you already can't get a room down the Cape in Tucker right. Vineyard right now and the North Shore is selling out just as quickly. So the drive to and travel, people are comfortable. That's going to start happening. It's, you know, we're probably a year away, maybe next summer, they'll see some corporate Corporate travel and conventions coming back, but it's, uh, it's leisure's here already. It's here this summer. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. Daily? Um, I think we're going to see more and more chatter, and, you know, in addition to this, but more and more chatter about green economy and uh, the, the way we run run the operations around greenhouse gas. I think we're and you know e what what you'll hear ESG reporting, environmental, social, and governance reporting from a corporate level. Um, I think all of those things are going to start and impacting the operations and, and efficiency is going to be going to be part of it. But all of this, as we come out of the pandemic is going to be, you know, there's going to be, be a lot of, uh, a lot of activity uh, on a local level. And then as we said, start starting next year on the, on the corporate and, and beyond. And, and John, just quick, because <laughs> we like know you, you already handled <laughs> most of the questions already. I like to compare it to the Great Depression. That's what COVID-19 year was. And now we're going into the roaring 20s. I like it. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, John. And Rob, th thank you for moderating. Sure, Excellent my pleasure. Job. Thank you, panel. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. And thank I appreciate you. you, everyone attending today. I appreciate everyone on the panel uh, speaking. I want to thank our sponsors one more time before we go. I want to thank U.S. Pavement, 
Services, Group One Partners, Northmark, Northern Bank, and Evolution Energy Partners. I want to thank you all, and I want to wish everyone a happy Thursday. Thank Thanks, you, Rick. Thank you, Pat.